everybody in here is going to attend. Um, for those who don't know me, uh, I teach in the School of Architecture, um, and are tangentially involved with this uh, series of, of lectures. Uh, a group of our students is working on uh, one of the internment camps uh, interpretive facilities in Midoka, where most uh, Japanese American attorneys from Oregon uh, were sent. Uh, so that's kind of my connection to, to the series, which is not about architecture, but um, this is the raw material for, for our architecture project. Um, before our speaker for this evening is, is introduced, uh, and that's going to be done by someone else um, from, from Rural, uh, we have uh, this evening, uh, because Peggy Nagai uh, is a a former faculty member in the UO uh, School of Law, um, former dean of that, or assistant dean of that school. It seemed appropriate that we have uh, a representative of the, the law school here uh, tonight. So, uh, Marty Harris, the uh, dean of the law school, has kindly agreed to come and introduce Peggy, who's from her discipline and formerly from her department. Um, before that, however, um, some of you will be familiar, and you're going to have to forgive me that I'm, I'm going over. Something you've already heard last week if you came to um, President Kashima's lecture. Um, but uh, the reason for this lecture series, then, or um, the means of this happening at all, um, is uh, down to Joe Yamauchi and specifically his memory. Um, so I wanted to uh, just explain a little bit for those who haven't heard just who Joe was, because uh, the Department of Architecture, myself included, up until about three or four weeks ago, I had no idea. Um, so um, the story is then, um, that Joe uh, Yamuchi um, was born in 1949. Uh, prematurely, his mother had measles when he was a small, uh, when she was still carrying him, and as a result, he was um, had various uh, disabilities. Not such that it stopped him working, but for example, I, I heard the other day that he couldn't hear running water until he got a hearing aid after he got married. So, uh, and despite all of that, he was a sports uh, uh, man at high school. He spent his high school um, days in, in Portland, he was born in Portland, um, and um, went to uh, Portland State University to study art and design, and then moved down here at the beginning of the 1970s. Uh, to the Department of Architecture to train as an architect. And uh, both in Portland and here in the U of O School of Architecture, um, Joe's best friend was a Chinese American, not a Japanese American, uh, Jerry Lee. And Jerry Lee, uh, after um, Joe uh, left the department here, and this is a photograph we learned last week from Jerry Lee, who was here, that this is a photograph actually taken by Jerry Lee of Joe Yamanuchi when they were here in this department. When they uh, graduated, they went separate ways. Um, Jerry Lee went on to found one of the biggest architectural companies in, uh, in the United States, uh, Mulvaney T2, as it's now known. Um, certainly the biggest architectural practice on the West Coast and in the top 10 in the country in terms of numbers of employees. Um, Joe, first of all, worked uh, for ZGF uh, in Portland, uh, a large practice in Portland, then moved down to the Bay Area, and he worked with uh, Fisher Friedman in the San Francisco Bay Area for several years, and then eventually, for the final kind of decade of his career, moved back up to Seattle to uh, rejoin uh, with Jerry Lee at Mulvaney T2. Um, and he did so uh, not only because of that connection, but because of his mother, uh, Joel's mother, was sick and was in the Seattle area. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, in 1998, uh, Joe's kind of uh, physical problems eventually caught up with him. He uh, caught pneumonia, and because of the uh, poor blood circulation in his lungs, it, it, it actually killed him. So, that's the story of, of how he uh, ended up uh, being lost to us uh, at a ridiculously young age. Uh, just to fill in that story, uh, Joel's father, um, George Yamanuchi, uh, considered Joel's entire life to have been on borrowed time, that by rights, uh, a two month old, uh, two month premature baby probably wouldn't have survived uh, one in a hundred, possibly, uh, in the late 40s. So, um, 
Joel was very lucky to live as long as he did. It was George's um, was take on it. So the sad part is that George Yamaguchi, his father, actually outlived his son, which is um, pretty desperate. But I think he knew um, you know, that, that uh, Joel had, uh, had a terrific life. Was a um, by all accounts, an extremely generous. I uh, you know, he was the weekend before he died. He, he was out doing charity work, uh, mm. very similar to Joe Lee, who was here last week, and is, is still doing that kind of philanthropic work. So Joe, uh, we described him as an architect. But he was a lot more than that. Um, um, so uh, shortly after Joe's uh, sudden and, and, and shocking death, then Jerry Lee and Mitch Smith, another uh, partner in Mulvaney G2, said, "Well, what can we do about this? You know." We, need to mark this in some way. And it was they then, and not Joel, um, but in Joel's memory, um, who set up the Joel Yamaguchi Fund, which funds an architecture studio in, in this department each year. And to our shame, I think, uh, for five years, I think it is, we've been taking the Joel Yamaguchi money without fully really understanding who Joel was. And, uh, so to cut a long story short, then, um, I, I figured that Joel was probably connected in some way, being Japanese-American, it would have been difficult not to have been connected to the internments or to have been affected by it in some way. But I didn't know at all uh, until the last couple of months that just how connected Joel was. So um, this is Joel's parents, um, George and Mari uh, Yamuchi, uh, right after they were just released from uh, Minidoka Relocation Center um, in rural Idaho. Um, and the reason that Joel was released was because he enlisted voluntarily in the all Japanese 442nd uh, uh, Infantry Combat Unit. Uh, and right after this photograph was, was taken, he was um, sent to Europe. Um, and um, so he was fighting in Italy when he was wounded and uh, eventually uh, repatriated, uh, won a Purple Heart uh, as a result. So Joel was uh, little to my uh, did I know that he was that directly connected. Um, not only were, were his siblings, his older siblings, not Joel himself, but his older siblings and his uh, parents and grandfather were all at Minidoka, but his father was in the 442nd um, voluntarily. Um, and just to add to this, um, uh, I thought that was the end of the story. And then um, uh, in looking around for speakers, I was uh, talking to one of the attorneys, one of the lawyers who was involved in a, a key case, the other key case that um, Peggy Nagai is going to talk about, uh, the key case that most relates to Oregon, um, Min Yasui being an Oregon graduate, um, but the case closely connected to that, that, that Peggy likewise was connected to, was led by um, this character, um, so this is Min Yasui who's going to come up in a moment, this is Fred Korimatsu, you're going to hear his name, mentioned, forgive me, I've forgotten, um, uh, Hayashi? Gordon Hirabayashi. Hirabayashi. Mm -hmm. um, so these are the three key court cases. Um, um, and this was, I believe, Peggy tells me, right after the um, Fred Coronats case. This uh, young lawyer, 35-year-old, mm -hmm. Dale Minami, uh, was um, Joel's first cousin. Um, and I had no idea, uh, as I say, when, when we started this, uh, that he was that closely mm -hmm. connected. Um, so Joel uh, didn't speak about this much at all, but was closely connected, and it seems appropriate then that uh, at least this year um, we are addressing the, and I have neglected to mention that the Yamauchi lecture, uh, sorry, studio is directed towards issues of diversity, so um, it seemed appropriate this year to address the, uh, the issue of racial prejudice and, and uh, discrimination then that affected Joel's uh, family most directly. Um, so, as I mentioned, um, our speaker tonight uh, is uh, up there with Dale, Mian uh, Dale Minami as, uh, as a leading uh, figure in the, uh, in the story of, of redress uh, after the internments in the last 20 years. Um, has many connections to the U of O, and I'm going to let uh, Monty Paris of uh, the law school then, um, explain a little bit more about. Uh, uh, 
poetically honored and delighted to introduce Taking the Guy and also to hear this story uh, about Joel and Yamauchi, which I had not known about. And what a number of connections are kind of being brought to fruition tonight. Not only my connection with Peggy and the law school's connection with Peggy, um, we had met once but didn't overlap here at the University of Oregon, uh, but also this connection between Peggy through Dale uh, to Joel. Um, as you're no doubt aware, the Japanese internment experience produced not only uh, a huge injustice, but also an amazing fight for civil rights that has and will continue to benefit people from all walks of life. Um, and civil rights activists. Peggy Nagai is one of those activists. I want to tell you a little bit about, first, about the person that she is going to speak about, Minoru Yusui, to give you a little bit of a context um, of Peggy and her work, and then I'll tell you a little bit about Peggy. Um, Minoru, or Min Yusui, as his family and friends knew him, was born and raised in Hood River, and he was what we now call a double duck, since we've kind of now adopted that the brand, the duck brand, um, I doubt that he would refer to himself as a double duck. But he got both his undergraduate and his law degrees from the University of Oregon. And in 1939, after he graduated from law school and took the Oregon Bar Examination and passed, he became the first person of Japanese American ancestry to be licensed to practice law in Oregon. Um, and I'm not going to give you many details of his life, I'll leave, I'll leave that to Peggy, but um, he became uh, famous for defying the curfew order that was imposed as a result of the internment, the executive order that, that created the Japanese American internment. He defied the curfew order intentionally and publicly uh, because it was his belief, rightly as it turned out, um, that that order was unconstitutional. Um, he was obviously, uh, once the police kind of took notice of his defi defiant of the order, he was imprisoned, he was stripped of his citizenship. Um, ultimately, his citizenship was returned to him by the United States Supreme Court, but that court refused to overturn his conviction on violating the curfew order because it said that the curfew order was of military necessity. And it was years later, um, that Peggy Nagai took his case to finally get that, or at least to attempt to get that conviction overturned, and to establish that there was really misconduct in the, in the uh, case that was put forward by the military to claim that there was a military necessity for the internment order. So let me tell you a little bit about Peggy Nagai. Um, Peggy obviously was the lead attorney in the case Yasui versus the United States. She came to that case as a, a young trial lawyer. She had had, I think, five years of experience um, trying cases. And at the time that she came to the University of Oregon, um, hired by then Dean Derek Bell of the law school to become a faculty member and assistant dean, she, she had already started to represent Yasui. Um, and she just told me now that she had, uh, she had told Dean Bell um, when he offered her the job, I'll come and take that job, but I will only do so if you let me take this case with me and work on it while, uh, while I'm at the law school. And obviously, he had the good sense to let her do that. Um, she um, has, um, in addition to the service that she performed as a trial lawyer and as assistant dean in the law school, um, gone on to great acclaim as um, a consultant to law firms. She now has her own business that is called Peggy the Guy Consulting. Um, she's been doing that for 17 years um, quite successfully. She works in that, um, in that consulting firm with organizations that are interested in promoting the health of their organizations, particularly around diversity <coughs> issues. And um, she obviously brings to that work a great deal of perspective that she gained from her work, among other things, um, on the Yasui case. So I think without wasting your time anymore, I will uh, bring you the <coughs> Thank you very much, Margie. Yeah. Jean, um, 
It's, uh, as Marcus said, I came down, I've lived in Eugene three different times, but when I was at the law school, I'm talking really loud. When I was at the law school, um, I had the privilege of working with Derek Bell as his assistant dean. Derek was the first black tenure professor, first black tenure professor at Harvard, but he also was the first black law dean outside of historically black law schools. And then to have Min Yasui as a client, it uh, doesn't get better than that, I tell you, in the legal profession. And it was really the highlight of my career. So if I can figure out how to, okay. As, whoa, okay. As Margie said, Yasui was born in Hood River. His father uh, immigrated from Japan. His father had wanted to become an attorney but because he could not become a naturalized citizen, uh, he couldn't become a lawyer because the law said that you had to be eligible to become a citizen in order to be eligible to become a lawyer. But he was a very successful businessman in Hood River um, and was quite surprised after, uh, after Pearl Harbor. He was taken away by the Department of Justice and interned in um, a Department of Justice camp in Montana. Um, but that I think his biggest surprise was that none of his Caucasian friends really stood up for him. And when you feel that you are part of a community and you feel like you have been part of a community and a leader, a businessman, an orchardist in that community, to not have your friends stand up for you was a, an amazingly defeating experience for Min's father. <laughs> Uh, this is Min Yasui, his dapper self back uh, in those days and quite young. He uh, couldn't find a job after he graduated from law school here in Oregon practicing law. So he got a job at the Japanese consulate in Chicago. He could speak Japanese and that his father had some connections so he got a job there. Um, but once the Pearl Harbor happened, his father sent him a telegram saying, uh, as war has started, your country needs your service as a United States Reserve Officer, and I, as your father, strongly urge you to respond to the call immediately. And so he, came, he, he resigned his position on December 8th. He came back to Portland. He tried to become active nine different times. He went uh, to do that nine different times, and nine different times they, they refused him. Um, when Min came back, his father's uh, Assets had been frozen. His mother and their younger, his younger siblings were in Hood River having a, a challenging time. This is General DeWitt, and DeWitt was the commander of the Western Defense Command, which is parts of Oregon, Washington, California, Montana, Utah, and Arizona. And uh, once Executive Order 9066 was passed, February 19, 1942, it, was, it said that the commanding officer of the area could determine who would be, who could stay and who could be excluded from this Western Defense Command. And uh, that happened in February and March. Um, he started making curfew orders. And he also wrote a report that was in the National Archives. There were 10 copies. He sent out 10 copies of those reports. We later found out that nine of those copies, they, they pulled them all back in. Nine of them were destroyed, and the one that was kept was altered. And here's what General DeWitt said. A Jap is a Jap. Racial affinities are not severed by migration. The Japanese race is an enemy race. And while many second and third generation Japanese born on United States soil, possessed of United States citizens, have become Americanized, the racial strains are undiluted. So as we, set, as we looked for evidence or as we talk about military necessity, this is on the other side of that argument. This is the argument before that argument. Um, uh, and interestingly enough, in Hawaii, there was a different uh, military commander, and as you probably know, the, there was no mass incarceration in Hawaii. But he knew about Hawaii, he understood more about the culture there 
than certainly General DeWitt did. So as Margie said, men intentionally violated the curfew to test the constitutionality. He was a patriot. He believed that the court would vindicate his rights. Little did he realize that he would stay in solitary confinement for nine months as his case went up to the US Supreme Court. They wouldn't let him bathe. They wouldn't let him cut his hair. They wouldn't let him cut his toenails or his fingernails. It was a pretty amazing situation for somebody who had, uh, was a lawyer. And you know, for the law, how many law students are in the audience? So for the law students in the audience and for lawyers like Scott and myself, you know, Min was 26 years old when he decided to violate the curfew. How many of us would put our careers on the line and our liberty on the line and believe in the Constitution enough to say that I'm going to be the test case? He tried to find a test case, you know, a World War I veteran, a father with children, et cetera. No one would step forward, so he did. Um, and he was worried his mother would not like that, but she said, go do what you have to do. So pretty amazing family. Um, so the trial took place uh, in Federal District Court in Oregon, June 12, 1942. And um, Judge James Elger Fee presided. It was to the court. Um, Mins had a, uh, an attorney, Earl Bernard. Um, and I had the privilege of playing Earl a couple months ago uh, because we did a reading of the Yasui case in Portland. So it's pretty amazing to uh, get, I, don't, I didn't look like Earl, but I think I sounded like Earl. Um, and it was pretty amazing to step into 1942 and what that felt like. It's a very different feeling to actually be the attorney being in court arguing the case. Uh, what Judge Fee said was that the military order was unconstitutional as to U.S. citizens but that since Yasui had worked for the Japanese consulate, he had abrogated his US citizenship. So he was no longer a citizen. So you could take drastic action based on race if you're not a US citizen. So that uh, issue obviously went up on appeal and uh, was later reversed in terms of citizenship. Yasui did this in, 1940, uh, in March of 1942. These orders came down in May. So four days after the military curfew was promulgated, he was out on the street getting arrested. Uh, these orders came down later. This is from San Francisco. My mother was 19. My father was 22. She, was, uh, she went to Oregon City High School. He went to Beaverton High School. So they're born in Oregon. Um, and uh, in May of 42, you could take as much as you could carry. You went to the North Portland Livestock Pavilion. They took the horses out. They took the cows out of the stalls, and they brought in 3,600 Japanese Americans from around the state of Oregon as a temporary measure. And then in September, they went to Minidoka, uh, Idaho, which was out in the desert. There were 10 camps all together. Uh, again, they went. Uh, in trains with the, with the um, windows shaded, not knowing where they were going to go. So here are some pictures of people taking all the belongings, what they, what they could uh, carry with them. I didn't realize until 1979 that my father had been arrested for curfew violation and that men had helped get an attorney. He was arrested and in Multnomah County Jail because my father was trying to get somebody to lease his farm in Boring. I grew up in Boring. Uh, not an adjective for the state of Oregon, but actually a place in Oregon. Uh, but that if he didn't pay the mortgage, if the mortgage wasn't paid on the farm, they would, it would be uh, foreclosed. So here they were, they were being taken away, and they still had to get the mortgage paid. So he was out trying to do that, got arrested for curfew violation, he and my uncle. My uncle tells me, your father didn't really seem to care that much about getting out of jail. I don't know. Uh, but Yasui helped him get out of jail, and eventually they went to Minidoka. So here's some more pictures of uh, families with numbers. Uh, those, those are numbers that they had. They became numbers. 
And here are the internment sites. There are 10 of them uh, throughout the western states. And there were Department of Justice camps as well. So Minidoka, um, where Joel's parents were, where my parents were, where many people from Oregon were, my father got paroled out of the camp, got paroled out of the camp to, for labor. Uh, and people did that. My grandparents stayed in. All my relatives were incarcerated. <clears throat> so this is, what, this is what their lovely home looked like. Um, and as I said, the, the Yasui case was appealed, but so was Gordon Hirabayashi's case and Fred Korematsu. Gordon was a student at U UW. He was a Quaker, um, and he got arrested for curfew violation as well as not wanting to evacuate. Uh, uh, Fred Korematsu was in San Leandro, California. He had a girlfriend and didn't want to be evacuated. So he tried the best as he could to change his features so that he wouldn't be arrested. He did get arrested. Uh, and this is the Supreme Court in 1943-44 that heard the cases. Uh, here's Gordon. And what they said in Hirabayashi was that we cannot reject as unfounded the judgment of the military authorities. Now remember, that military authority was General DeWitt, who said a jab is a jab, and that the Japanese race is an enemy race. That there were disloyal members of that population. One of the, one of the three prongs of the government's argument was that they, there was a possibility of espionage or sabotage on the part of Japanese Americans. Um, we cannot say that the war-making branches did not have the ground for believing in a critical hour that such person could not be isolated and separately dealt with. And what uh, DeWitt said in his report was, actually he said, you can't separate the goats from the sheep. It doesn't matter how long you had uh, to determine that. And what he's saying is that it wasn't about time. It really was about race. Um, but the court accepted these arguments on, based on the government's argument with very little. They essentially took judicial notice of these things. The Supreme Court said because American society had discriminated against Japanese legally, politically, and other ways, that therefore they posed an even greater threat. So uh, that's a catch-22. Uh, if you're discriminated against, of course you'd be angry against the government, so therefore you, you'd want to get uh, back at the government. Of course, it was the government that did that in the first place. Uh, but that circular argument, and, and I know that people say it's in time of war and it's in time of fear, but if you go back and read the history of, of that period in time, there was a lull. There, there was not immediate mass incarceration. That happened as the winds, the political, economic winds got whipped up. And uh, some of the, at least in Oregon, um, some of the laws, you know, the anti-alien land laws, this did not happen in a vacuum. There were years of discriminatory laws happening in Oregon as well as in other states so that in 1924, there was the Anti-Japanese Immigration Act, but before then in Oregon, there was the Anti-Alien Land Laws, which said that if you couldn't become a citizen, you couldn't own land. The Supreme Court had said, if you're not black or you're not white, you can't become a citizen. So being lawyers, I guess, who put these laws together, they hooked all these rights to being eligible to become a citizen. Can't, can't have a business license, you can't testify in court, you can't do this, that, and the other thing unless you're eligible to become a citizen. So my grandparents who came here could not become naturalized citizens. My grandparents came here in the early 1900s and it was 1952 uh, until they could be naturalized citizens. So, and the anti-Japanese sentiment in this state was uh, done by several different groups, including um, the Foreign Legion, different packers associations and growers associations, and in 1925 in the city of Toledo on the coast, 
they burned down and ran off all the Japanese laborers because the Japanese immigrants came for labor reasons to the US. So I guess that's the other story behind the story, which is this is the culmination. It didn't start with Pearl Harbor. It really was a decades-long uh, discriminatory impact. So Yasui, what the government argued was the danger of espionage and sabotage by persons of Japanese ancestry really justified extraordinary action. And the truth was there was no single incident of espionage or sabotage found on the part of any Japanese American throughout the war. Um, that all Japanese, even US citizens, were by culture and race predisposed to loyalty to Japan and disloyalty to the US. So how do you become predisposed to loyalty to one place and not another? And why does it sound familiar in recent times? Japanese on the West Coast had committed, likely to commit, again, that mass action necessary because no time to determine disloyal in, disloyalty individually. So fear, time, pressure um, were all things that people will say are reasons for what happened. Here's Fred Korematsu. Can you tell he tried to change the shape of his eyes? <laughs> um, so Korematsu was the fountainhead for strict scrutiny, which was the basis for Brown versus Board of, Board of Education. Uh, it was founded on Korematsu, but they just didn't apply strict scrutiny, really. Uh, or <clears throat> what they said was military necessity was a compelling state interest. So all legal restrictions which curtail the civil rights of a single racial group are immediately suspect under strict scrutiny. They just didn't apply their holding to this case. Only the gravest imminent danger to public safety can justify such great deprivations. There were 120,000 Japanese Americans incarcerated, 70% of whom were US citizens. Uh, Korematsu was not excluded from the military areas because, uh, because of hostility to his race, to him or his race. The military imperative answers the question of race. So today we call it national security. Before they called it military necessity. But it is that belief that in times, times of war, who's gonna, who is going to step forward? Which branch of government really takes control? Justice Robert H. Jackson dissented and said that the court for all time has validated the principle of racial discrimination in criminal procedure and of transplanting American citizens. The principle lies like a loaded weapon, ready for the hand of any authority that can bring forward a plausible claim of urgent need. And that weapon uh, was brought forward after, after September 11th, uh, when people were rounded up based on, and um, I remember driving and hearing government officials say, we have to do this, it's really, uh, it's really because of national security, and they were quoting Korematsu, and they were quoting Hirabayashi. And the fact that we took these cases on, we did it for pro, pro bono for seven years, so it wouldn't happen again. And then to hear it being the justification again, for deprivation of fundamental rights was just more than I could almost bear. Um, so what's the lessons from internment and the internment cases? Uh, the court deferred to the government's claim of military necessity, and they had exculpatory evidence. The FBI had been spying on the Japanese community for years. They had an ABC list. They knew. A was the least, most likely suspects, B and C. J. Edgar, J. Edgar Hoover said, you do not have to incarcerate. They are not a threat. Office of Naval Intelligence did their own surveillance, came up with the same uh, conclusion as to the federal communication. Um, and the president, President Roosevelt, had his own person, Curtis Munson, go out and scout around the country. And he came back and said the same thing. So 
in the face of the data, in the face of the evidence, they made a contrary decision. So not based on data, but based on something else. And always the question of why not other, if it was military necessity and it was the time of war, why not the mass incarceration of Germans and Italians? What was the difference between uh, those groups of people? And why not in Hawaii? And then they started drafting Japanese American men from the camps. So the parents were incarcerated and they were drafted into the 442nd. And a lot of people volunteer for the 442nd. The 442nd is the most decorated combat unit in the history of the military. They were trying to prove their loyalty with their blood. So when they went in to, uh, to get the Texas Battalion, they actually suffered more casualties than they got, than people that they brought out. But there was over 100% casualty because they kept getting wounded and going back to work, or going back to work, going back to war rather than recuperating. So here's, I think, a typical family where they're incarcerated and they've got this picture of their son in, uh, in the army. So it wasn't just wartime. It was wartime coupled with racism. And it was this belief that uh, the threat of the other. So it, Italian Americans might not have been the other at that time. German Americans might not have been the other at that time, though they might have been the other earlier in this, in this history. But they also, uh, as Jerry King of UCLA said, they underestimate as well the burden on those who are others. So what would it be like for you to be told that you're going to leave based on your racial characteristics and you can only take what you can carry. You don't know where you're going and you don't know how long you're going to be there. Sometimes it's, it's even hard for me to imagine that it happened to my parents because it is, it is so against anything that I understood. I grew up in the 60s. Uh, it's even really hard for me to imagine what it's like and it feels like so distant history until September 11th. So what historian Roger Daniels said is, it's not a wartime mistake. It's really an idea of whose country it is and who has a right to be here and who has a right not to be here. And here's one of the signs. And there were many signs like that all up and down the West Coast. And it's not dissimilar to many other institutions where you ask who has the right to be at the top of the class. It's a question that I asked when I was assistant dean at the law school. Who do we see, who do we picture as the people who have the right to be at the top of the class? It's a very similar thing. So here they are, those dapper guys in 1983. So you see, Fred, uh, you see Gordon Hirabayashi, men in the middle, and, and Fred. We came together, 30-some uh, or 40-some lawyers from Washington, from Northern California, and from Oregon. And I was, you know, I was told by Dale that what they were, what they were going to do is to consolidate the cases in California so that I would only have to be the lead attorney for six months as they brought the motion for consolidation. And we did bring that motion for consolidation. It was denied. So what they said was, you've got to go back to the courts of, uh, of original jurisdiction, which was the Federal District Court of Oregon, the Northern District Court of California, and the Western District Court of Washington. And so we had three different legal teams, but we worked uh, very closely together. And Scott Meisner, who's here, wave, Scott, uh, was on the, the team in Eugene. As you can imagine, being in Eugene, there wasn't a huge Japanese-American community here, and there certainly weren't a lot of 
uh, Japanese American or even Asian American lawyers. So we got Fern Ng and Mary Mori, who were the only, and Bert Fukumoto, I think, and myself, I think we were the only Asian lawyers in town. Uh, so we had a team that's, that went up and down the I-5 corridor. Here in court, so we had, uh, we filed quorum petition, writ of error quorum nobis. Now, all you know what that means, right? How about the law students? Do you know what that means? I had no idea what it meant. <laughs> so it's an extraordinary writ that can be brought after somebody has served their sentence. If there was a fundamental error and what you're saying is that fundamental error caused the decision to go awry. And this, this, the writ of error quorum nobis was thought about by Bill Maritani and Frank Schumann, both Nisei or second generation lawyers in the early 70s. They said we ought to bring a writ of error quorum nobis. The only problem was they needed the evidence to show that there was a fundamental error that occurred and they didn't have that evidence. It really wasn't until Peter Irons, who was a law professor, went to the National Archives, and, and Peter was looking for other information, and he had been a conscientious objector, and he was just looking in the National Archives, and he ran across some evidence. He ran across DeWitt's report, and uh, Iko Herzig started also doing research. So we then, I mean, they looked at thousands and thousands of pages of documents. And we came out with some smoking guns. The uh, Office of Naval Intelligence, the DeWitt Report, all these things that said it's not necessary to incarcerate. And what we realized when we read the briefs uh, to the Supreme Court, that they had altered material evidence and they had suppressed exculpatory evidence, and they had denied the defense evidence that would have been material to their case. So that's what we argued in our petitions for writ of error quorum nobis. Had the courts had these documents at the time, they would have found that what, what the government and military were doing were unconstitutional. So those were the documents. That's why we had the writ of error quorum nobis. And I'm sure you're going to teach it next year, Margie, when you get back to practice, uh, teaching, right? <laughs> so, uh, and what Patel, the Korematsu case was the first case to go to a hearing. The government didn't respond to, the, to our petition. So judge, it's Marilyn Hall Patel. And if you notice that name Patel, her husband is um, South Asian. And what she said is, because they, the government refused to uh, answer the petition, then they agreed to the petition. So they agreed to the, with the, you know, the government attorney sputtering and, oh, what, no, no, no. Uh, and what she said was, in times of distress, a shield of military necessity and national security must not be used to protect governmental actions from close scrutiny and accountability. It stands as a caution that in times of international hostility and antagonisms, our branches must be prepared to exercise their authority to, pro to protect citizens from petty fears and prejudices. Where was she after September 11th? You know, because that brings this to me full circle. That's what she said. In Yasui's case, uh, we had Judge Robert Baloney, who when he got, Scott, were you there? Were you at the hearing? When he got on the bench, uh, he said, why are we here? That was his first question. I, I could have shot him right there. Uh, we had a room full of Nisei uh, who had been incarcerated, and this judge doesn't, and, and Min Yasui standing there, and he didn't know what we were doing in court. Um, he had been on the Delcon Shield case, sitting on the Delcon Shield case in Eugene, and was very busy with that case. He looked at, you know, we had a stack of documents. And uh, this is like a lawyer's nightmare, because there was no precedent for quorum nobis. There was no precedent, factual precedent, for our cases. 
every brief that we wrote, we thought this could be our last brief. And if it is our last brief, what do we want to say? And uh, how do you, so it's hard to go into court feeling really secure about your case when there's no precedent and you're arguing, you're arguing lack of due process and equal protection, but there's no case on all fours. So what the government said, we agree, the, the, they got smarter after Korematsu. They actually answered the petition and said, we agree, we want to vacate his conviction but we don't think it's necessary to have any factual findings. We wanted the factual findings. Why? Because this was, this was an education process. This was, we had done not just a legal case. We had an educational component. We had a, a community empowerment component. It was really civil rights lawyers doing strategy on how to have this case or lar case larger than, than, than just a legal case. And at the same time, there was a redress mo movement for Japanese Americans to get congressional reparations for being incarcerated. While we, didn't, we kept our separate boundaries, those things were going on at the same time. Um, so the, the evidence, the factual evidence was really important for us to have a forum in which people would get educated about what happened and that there would be then a record of governmental misconduct. But what the, um, and that w what we argued was it was a duty to protect the public interest by examining the documents. But the court said uh, that the two requests are the same which they weren't, and declined to make findings 40 years later, uh, held that any fact finding had no legal consequences, which actually is not true if you could debunk the factual underpinnings of the case. You could then use it for other cases similarly situated. So the, uh, we appealed the lack of an evidentiary hearing. It went to the Ninth Circuit before the Ninth Circuit heard. The case, Min died November 12, 1986. He had been a leader in the, in the redress movement. He, he, one of the things he told me when we first got started was, I don't know if we're going to win Peggy, but we're going to give him hell. And you have to remember that Min was from my parents' generation. He was a Nisei, a second generation. I was the age of his daughter. I was a girl. If you come from ethnic communities, you know all the sort of generational as well as gender machinations that go on. So to have a lawyer as my client and to be the same age as his daughter as his lawyer was a cultural phenomena. And, uh, but he was a fabulous client. The government moved to dismiss the appeal. The Ninth Circuit uh, upheld their motion, granted their motion. We appealed to the US Supreme Court, and the court upheld the, the, the motion and dismissed the case. It was really a sad day for many of us who had fought so long and for, so hard. But for Min Yasui, who was the lawyer who intentionally violated the curfew, put his liberty and his career on the line. He wanted to become a politician. He moved from, he, he was in jail for uh, nine months, and then they, he went to Minidoka, got paroled out, went to, went to Denver, wanted to become a politician, but he had a federal conviction on his record. That was a federal conviction. So he chose not to become uh, a politician. He had a hard time, pa he passed the, the, the Colorado bar, but he had to go into a hearing because he had a federal conviction on his record. So it wasn't without collateral consequences, and that's what the government argued. There were no consequences to this conviction. That's basically what they said. Um, so the Hirabayashi case actually went to trial with a judge who didn't say, why are we here, with a judge who had read a lot extensively about World War II, Judge Voorhees in Seattle. What was astounding about that case was one, you know, the government lawyer, Victor Stone, was the same lawyer on all three cases. And uh, he would breeze into court and sort of not do the local rules and just kind of bring in his box of documents and want them all. 
to be introduced. The judge there said, uh-uh, you're following the local rules here, buddy. Uh, and so pushed back on that. But it was very interesting because this was the third case, and I was sitting in the audience, and the government argued as though Pearl Harbor happened last week. It was the weirdest thing to hear 40 years later how, what a military necessity, how dangerous it was, the imminent danger of harm, et cetera, et cetera. He'd read the same documents we had read. But Edward Ennis testified on our behalf. Edward Ennis was the author of the Korematsu Hirabayashi and Yasui Supreme Court briefs in 1943 and 44. He was the real deal. He was the guy that wrote those briefs. And he said the government lied, altered evidence, didn't provide exculpatory evidence. He died shortly after that trial. There were other people who were high government officials who never recanted. Uh, Earl Warren did. Earl, Earl Warren, who is known uh, on the Supreme Court for his civil rights decisions, ran on the platform, an anti-Japanese platform, when he ran for attorney general and governor in the state of California. But John J. McCloy, who was one of the authors of the whole incarceration, never recanted. Um, so the court held that Hirabayashi proved governmental misconduct, which violated his due process as to evacuation, but not as to the curfew. So both sides appealed that decision to the Ninth Circuit, and Mary Schroeder, who was a Ninth Circuit judge, said any person who was in, impacted by this military curfew was harmed, aggrieved forever, is what she said. So I'll tell you, two strong opinions. They happen to be females. I'm sure it was just an accident. Um, but very strong opinions on Korematsu and Hirabayashi, and a very weak one on Yasui. So post quorum nobis, Judge, uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist in 1989 still believed that those cases were good law and should have, and were applicable and appropriate, especially as applied to the first generation Issei. So in the face of data, in the face of evidence, uh, it is hard to understand rational, linear thinkers looking at that evidence and coming up with uh, this decision without martial law, without trial, without individual claims of um, criminal action. So September 11th and the aftermath of September 11th, what would happen to the people who look like the enemy? Would it be another Pearl Harbor? There was scapegoating that happened. You all probably know that. There were hate crimes against Middle Eastern and South uh, Asians. Uh, people were murdered. There was a store owner in Arizona, a Sikh, who was killed. Uh, a Native American woman run over because of her brown skin. Do you remember air, airline pilots who refused to allow Middle Eastern uh, passengers to fly and ban them from their planes? Um, those identified more like them rather than us. So the racial configuration in this country has been part of our history for, you know, hundreds of years. And more subtle or less subtle, they come into play in terms of the law. Um, and after September 11th, they, excuse me, they detained at least 1,100, um, quote, Middle Eastern people would not reveal their names, citizenships, place of uh, detention. and. Uh, you know, Ashcroft issuing the denial that the government has not uh, engaged in any abuse. In uh, <clears throat> November 12th of 2002, we as a quorum nobis letter, uh, uh, leaders and lawyers sent a letter to Congress saying, um, or to the president saying that we think that Ashcroft should be, uh, 
should be removed from his position based on uh, the lack of fulfilling civil rights that he would secretly arrested and detained over a thousand people, proposed to create detention camps similar to World War II, imprisoned U.S. citizens, Jose Padilla and others, indefinitely with no charges, breached the protective wall between criminal prosecution and the national security investigation, et cetera. Uh, we didn't get a reply. So the laws that said wiretapping, as you know, the Patriot Act was passed, 300 plus pages of documents that nobody read uh, that said that we could look at your bank accounts, we could look at your library cards, we could take a look, do wiretapping. Um, and President Bush at first said, you know, hold the line, let's be tolerant. But he also said, if you're not with us, you're against us. What does that mean? Uh, it meant guilt by association, I believe, based on ancestry, based on descent. Uh, and so racial profiling started. So earlier, the World War II cases were about racial profiling. They just didn't call it that. Uh, secret trials, terrorist task uh, force, et cetera. Um, they could only do this by curtailing fundamental rights of speech and association, um, Freedom of Information Act, free, uh, right to liberty, justice, char incarcerated without charges or trials. So, in times of national distress, the courts are influenced by popular politics. They will subtly renounce their role as guarantors of the Constitution, and they will defer to the executive and legislative branches. And as the American public, we also will give up our rights in the name of safety. You know, yes, you ought to racially profile Middle Eastern people if I feel safer. And we will give them up easily, without a fight, as we did after September 11th. Um, the courts do the same thing. They take a hands-off approach in times of war, legitimize rather than check the actions of the other two branches of government, they're not holding them accountable. So the parallels between the willingness of the courts to almost take judicial notice that the Japanese race uh, it has a predisposition to loyalty to Japan rather than to the US, very similar to what they didn't do or didn't say after September 11th. Um, and here's what Professor Natsu Saito said, we've been, as Asian Americans and as Latinos or South Asians, Middle Easterns, we've been racist foreign, presumptively disloyal, that Arab Americans and Muslims have been racist terrorists, foreign, disloyal, eminently threatening. Although Arabs trace their roots to the Middle East and claim many different religious backgrounds, and Muslims come from all over the world and adhere to Islam, distinctions are blurred, negative images, the common stereotypes that we're all Arabs, we're all violent, and we're all conducting a holy war. So what do we do? What do you do? What do you as law students do? What do we do as citizens? How do we protest? At the front end when these laws happened, at the back end when they're trying to be uh, looked at, but during World War II, at the front end, no one spoke up against the military orders and for the rights of American citizens of Japanese ancestry. Not the ACLU, not the NAACP, not the JACL, and JACL stands for Japanese American Citizens League. It was a organization formed by Nisei, second generation, U.S. citizens of Japanese descent. Basically what they said was, go to camp. Show your loyalty by going to camp. They didn't support men. The uh, ACLU chapter in, in Northern California 
did support Korematsu. I have to say that because Dave Fenanke is in the audience and he's the director of the ACLU of Oregon and a good friend. But they almost got, uh, uh, they wanted to pull their charter from the national ACLU. So what, what do you do in times of distress? When have you stood up when you've heard a racially derogatory comment? or when you've heard people say things about terrorists. What have you said? Or have you been quiet? Have you said, it's not about me, so I'm not going to say anything? Eugene is, an, to me, a, a great place to live and go to school. It's also thought of as being very liberal, yes? Go like this, yes. But is there? discrimination, bigotry, and bias in Eugene. Go like this. Unless you're, you know, in Nirvana. What do you do or say on a daily basis? What do you, what do you say in class when these thing, issues come up? Do you feel like you can speak up or on the street? Um, so we took a legal political strategy. Many of us had been out of law school for 10 years or less, but we had been raised in the 60s. So we came from a different time of not just drug, sex, and rock and roll, but a belief that uh, you can thwart the authority. Um, and so we did storytelling, scholarly work, community, uh, activism, uh, publicity, and education in addition to the legal cases because we weren't in there for the money. There was no money, and they had already served their time. These cases stand as precedent still, because while their convictions were vacated at the US Supreme Court, Korematsu still stands. We thought about taking our petitions to the US Supreme Court, and we asked a lot of scholars around the country, including Derrick Bell, should we do this? And they were worried that if we did take it to the Supreme Court, that the composition of the court might just take the underpinnings of strict scrutiny away. So we chose not to do that. So civil rights and community groups need to stand up and struggle in the courts, in the communities, in Eugene, in places where we live, speaking out so that national security does not overwhelm civil rights. We need to raise mobilized challenges uh, to rent things like Guantanamo Bay, which was just, is just a travesty. Um, and it's time really to say that loaded weapon needs to be laid down, that these cases live on today. Why? Because racial discrimination lives on today. Because in times of war, we will choose uh, restriction, curtailment of rights for, quote, safety over what this country was founded on, which was civil rights, due process, equal protection. And if not you, then who's going to speak up? So. Uh, these cases really were the highlight of my legal career. And just a, a little side note, I remember being in con law class and uh, having the Korematsu case. I was a, I was a third year student and uh, I didn't like law school. It was the worst educational experience I'd ever had. Um, and, uh, but, and I was thinking about the Korematsu case and thinking, what is it that I could do to right this wrong, given all my relatives were in camp? And there's nothing, because uh, the Supreme Court had heard the case. Where do you go after the Supreme Court hears a case? And, and so to have five years later the opportunity to have Min Yasui come in and say, would you be willing to look at my case, was pretty phenomenal. I had wanted to do my senior thesis, senior and college thesis, on these Japanese American cases. And my thesis advisor said, after you say that the cases are racist, what are you going to say? 
So I could have discovered that evidence, but no. <laughs> uh, so you never know what's going to happen to you if you're open to the possibility. I really had the privilege of being on the National Redress Committee that formed the Congressional Reparations Package that passed in 1988 for Japanese Americans. Um, and I had the privilege of being the lead attorney on this case. And then President, I had the privilege of being elect, uh, selected by, or appointed by President Clinton in 1986 to serve on the Civil Liberties Public Education Fund Board, which with reparations, we got a chunk, uh, got $3.5 million to disseminate to groups and to individuals to educate about World War II and these issues so that it didn't happen again. So this farm girl from Boring, Oregon, who grew up pretty poor without indoor plumbing, who never talked to a lawyer before she went to law school, and went to law school because I was a um, waitress in a resort in uh, Lake Placid, New York, upstate New York. And there were discriminatory practices. There were colored people's quarters, segregation. This is 1972. And I protested to the maitre d' and he said, why are you complaining? We're very nice to you. He said, besides that, our board of directors are 11 lawyers in New York City. We could fire all of the waitresses. You have no union. You have no protection. We could fire you tomorrow. Um, and get a whole new crew in. And most of the waitresses were white, except for me. I was the only non-white person serving in the dining room. I wanted to start a boycott of the waitresses because I knew if we could boycott, they, they're not going to find you know, 25 waitresses the next day. But people were too scared to do it. We were all college students, and they wanted, you know, they, they needed the money for their tuition. And even though I needed that as well, I just could not stand for what they were doing. And I said, having never talked to a lawyer, if lawyers are this powerful, I'm going to law school and fight for justice and equity. Now, that's a pretty naive uh, way to get to law school, but that's the reason why I went to law school. And uh, that's the reason why I went into criminal defense work and why I went into, I started at legal aid. Um, it's also the reason, actually, why I left the practice of law. Because it's very challenging to really uphold justice and equity and represent um, Chrysler. Now, somebody needs to represent Chrysler, granted. Uh, but I just found that in at least the consulting work that I do, that I can bring this, my belief in justice and equity, my parents' experience, to the work that I do. The other area that I love, uh, in common with Margie, is criminal defense work. I did criminal defense work and won a lot of cases based on wrapping myself around the flag and the Constitution and giving those closing arguments, believing in justice and due process and democracy and liberty. And that jurors also believed in those same things. It was just the police officers, the judges, and the DAs that were cynical. And so, and people used to ask me, isn't it challenging? What if they're guilty? I said, this is the easiest kind of work for me because I'm upholding the system for them, but for you and for me and for middle-class citizens. So one of the Supreme Court justices that came up to Eugene to speak one time said, the challenge for uh, upholding due process and equal protection in criminal cases is that jurors think that it only has to do with criminals, that it only applies to criminals. They don't think that middle-class people can be unreasonably searched and, and have unreasonable search and seizures. So if you're, if you're arrested, you're guilty. So it was very easy for me to say as a criminal defense attorney that I'm upholding the system for you and me. And I still believe that. And I'd still take those cases on if I were practicing. 
So thanks for listening. This is part of the Joel uh, Yamaguchi uh, series, and appreciate the opportunity to be back and, and talk to all of you. Peggy's uh, kindly agreed to, uh, to take some questions. Uh, uh, so, would you like to identify whoever is? Uh... Sure. Raise your hand, or I'll have to call on you. You know, I used to I used to teach law school. Yes. Could you kind of stand up, yeah. speak that way, so everybody can hear your? So the Yasui family reference in this presentation is also the same family. There's a book called Stubborn. Yes. It's the same Yasui family that Lauren Kessler, who was, is she still a professor at the journalism school, wrote about three generations of Yasuis, and that the library system in Oregon uh, adopted it for their book uh, earlier this year in February, and that's why we were doing the reading of the Yasui case in Portland. Okay, some of you bright law students, what's your question? Come on, your dean's here. Let's, let's, uh, let's show some spunk. Yes. Uh, because I was one of the organizers of an event called the Day of Remembrance in Portland. And now there are national days of remembrance, but it was to remember the incarceration starting with the assembly centers. So the first one was in Puyallup, outside of Seattle. And then they came down to Oregon, and six weeks later, we had the second day of remembrance in the country. And Min was the keynote speaker. And I had been uh, uh, involved in the Japanese American Citizens League chapter with his brother, Homer. Homer and I had knocked down drag out fights about this issue, that issue. Uh, but on redress, we, we, uh, we really hung together and uh, resigned as co-chairs at one time to protest what was going on and all that stuff. So he uh, met me at the Day of Remembrance. He asked me, could you gather a group of Asian lawyers in Portland? and I would like to come and talk to them about my case, so I did that. He came, there were Japanese, Chinese, et cetera, lawyers in this meeting, and they started talking about his case as though it were a negligence case or a slip and fall case. Do you know what I mean? Like a common, ordinary accident case. Well, we're not sure, you know, you don't have strong evidence. And I just said, wait a minute. This is the case for our community. This is a community case. I will take your case. I don't care if any, no one is with me. I am taking this case. And that's how I became a legal lead attorney. <laughs> Thanks for that question. Others? Yes, Dave. Great. Push back against uh, the excesses of the Bush administration. The Obama administration has to, has to make a decision, will, will announce their decision tomorrow on whether or not they're going to allow uh, the most serious of the memos that justify the use of torture and should be released under the Freedom of Information. Uh, this is an ACLU case that's gone on for four years. Um, and uh, we'll find out tomorrow. So there's a lot of work that still needs to be done, even though we have 
a more sympathetic president and a more sympathetic attorney general. There's still a lot of bad stuff going on. Thanks, Dave. The ACLU has come back strong in Oregon, supporting the Yasui case, um, doing racial justice initiatives, uh, working hard on um, racial equity uh, with Dave and Bonnie's also in the audience. So uh, partners in this whole process of trying to uphold civil liberties. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>